right, so what are we going to cover in the next 20 minutes? A brief history of management liability policies. Um, we're going to do DNO basics, those questions you sort of, uh, uh, you know, still ask yourselves nowadays as to how we ended up with sides A, B and C. Um, I will use a Venn diagram. Uh, and uh, then I'll do, talk about entity covering management liability policies, internet liability versus cyber, stat liability cover, just a few things you should know, very interesting developments in that, in that market if you're getting into it, and then a quick summary at the end. All right, so let's do a um, brief uh, history of management liability policies. Neil Shepard set me straight on this. Um, we think the first one really came up in, uh, from AIG in 2000 with a product called Private Edge. Anyone want to go earlier? I think there was earlier management liability policy. We think that was the first one. And it's since evolved into a market staple. It's very cheap. Um, it's very popular. Um, but the, the theme of today, uh, we're talking about curse or cure, or cure or curse, depending on which paper you're looking at, uh, it is not public liability, it's not professional indemnity, and it's not product liability. And a lot of brokers are making the mistake thinking that it is a cure-all in the way you're selling it. So if you think it is a cure-all for all the ills, you'll be shot. That's just simple, and Gribbo will be bloody happy about it because you're, you're useless, you shouldn't have been in the profession in the bloody first place, all right? Okay, let's go to Dino Basics to see how management liability has evolved, uh, has evolved out of that. DNO, uh, so I've been practicing since 1992. DNO wasn't really around much before the 1990s. I know a few of the more experienced brokers will, will tell me about the policies. Um, I did have um, uh, Fred Hawke at Clayton Newts tell me that the first claims made policy. Actually, let's ask. When was the first claims made policy in Australia? Who wants to, who wants to have a punt? Okay, 1950s. Anyone? Anyone? 1940s? 1960s? Gribbo? When was it? The 70s, apparently 1923 was the first claims made policy. Um, I have no co confirmation of that. I probably got it off the internet. Um, so, but I remember, I remember DNO. The first time it really came onto the market was in the early 1990s, and there was a case involving Compass Airlines. I think you can still um, still find it at HIHV Carden. And the, uh, when the Australian Professional Indemnity Group started up, we'd have meetings, and the common joke would be, "You're still selling DNO? Yeah, selling DNO. Does it cover anything? No." No, it doesn't cover anything. And that, that, um, uh, that case just confirmed it when indemnity was successfully denied to some directors. But 20 years on, it's a very, very different picture. Um, and it's probably question number one that most boards ask, how's the DNO program? What does it involve? So how is it actually split up? Let's just go back to, because one of the, the key messages today is the difference between management liability and, and DNO and really getting our head around the, this, um, how entity cover is different to cover for directors. So I'm just going to break it down. Side A. Side A is cover for the personal liability of directors when the director is not entitled to an indemnity from the entity. I'm going to come back to this. Side B is cover for the personal liability of the director when the director is entitled to an indemnity from the entity, which is often called company reimbursement cover. And then side C is the liability of the entity only. Now, to just be quite clear about this, um, if I was a director um, of, a, of a large company and I was asked what, what cover would I actually want, having done many uh, claims for directors and have experienced the, the joys and perils of shared limits uh, between a number of directors, I would say I just want two million for me. I just want two million defence cost cover for me that I don't have to share with anybody. Right? That's just mine. I get my own lawyer. Um, and everything's tickety-boo. I don't share it with, I don't want penalties cover, I don't want anything, I just want enough resources behind me to defend myself. Now that's just a personal preference. I think Ribo shares a similar view, is that right? Um, but it's difficult, it's difficult to get into the market. But let's just go, what are we talking about? Side A, historically we've got differences between side A and side B because as a general rule, if you're an employee of a company, let alone a director, you are entitled to an indemnity from your employer for any liabilities you incur during the course of employment. Right? That's just one of the fundamental things. You make a mistake at work, you do something wrong at work, provided it's not an intentionally criminal act, and it's within the scope of the employment, and the courts give very, big def very broad definitions of that, you're entitled to an indemnity for your liability. Right? Now, as a director, it's a little bit more difficult, but as a director, when you get onto a board, there's one very critical document that any director who knows what they're doing wants, right? And it's called a deed of access and indemnity, right? And a deed of access and indemnity gives you two things. I'll just deal with the access point. 
access is when, when it all goes pear-shaped, uh, that you've got a right to access to the company documents so that you can defend allegations made against you. So that you've got all the material in front of you. Very, very important when everything, when everything goes badly. I was going to use another expression, but I am trying to control myself, obviously. Um, the other one is the deed of indemnity, which is the circumstances under which the corporation will indemnify you for a claim against you. Now, a standard one would be what we call accessorial liability. So there are various provisions under the Corporations Act and under the Trade Practices Act, now called the Australian Consumer Law, that can make a director personally liable for misleading and deceptive statements made by the company. Right? Those things are normally within the course of employment. If I was sued as a director or prosecuted by ASIC, I would go along to the company and say, you've got to cover me in relation to this. I did it in the course of my employment. The deed of indemnity covers me. Fine, big tick. That's side B, right? So I go and retain my lawyer, Natasha Stranovich or Paul Lamb, one of the very talented senior associates at DLA Piper, I say, represent me. They send me the bill, I give it to the company, or even the company retains them directly, and then they claim on the insurer. Right? That's side B. Side A is a category of offences or, or allegations. You almost always uh, regulatory actions where the company has either decided not to indemnify me for those liabilities or cannot, under the corporation's law, indemnify a director. Right? Now, a corporation is not allowed, under the corporation's law, to indemnify a director for a dishonest act. In fact, no one's allowed to indemnify anybody for a dishonest act. You can be indemnified for your defence costs, but not for, the actual, not for the actual act. So this is all the stuff where the director is completely on their own. And side A cover works in that I will now retain my lawyer and I will just send the bill off to the insurer. Right? So that's side A cover. So it's just for me. The company has either chosen not to indemnify me or agreed with that, or um, they're not allowed to. Now. Because of that sort of confusion, um, in the early 2000s, side C cover entered into the market. And initially, and it had a very brief sort of flare up and then it died down again. It, now it's come back in a, in a different form. But when side C cover came in, it was um, uh, really claims people or brokers saying that we're just, we're just a bit sick of this because a claim comes in and then the lawyers, and then all these fights ensue about whether or not the director is entitled to an indemnity in relation to this claim, as to whether or not it's side A or side B. So we just sort of want to forget about that, can't you come up with something? So they came up with side C, which was effectively saying, well, if there's an allegation against the, um, uh, the director, well, uh, we won't worry about that. The company will just cover it, right? Um, and it, was, it wasn't thought through very well. And what it did was make it very, very easy for claimants in class actions to access the insurance. They didn't really have to prove against each individual director that they'd done something wrong. They could sort of show in concert that they'd done something wrong and they'd still be able to claim on the policy. And so Side C sort of flared up some massive losses in the early 2000s and then it was withdrawn from the market and it's come back in terms of entity cover. So it's sort of like don't mention the war in relation to that Side C, if you can remember that fantastic episode of uh, faulty towers when the Germans um, stayed. Um, now, current issues in DNO. Um, firstly, the extent to which Site A should be standalone. Um, secondly, the peril of shared limits with other directors and officers. And with management liability, the issue is, and this is why it can be cure or curse, is that those shared limits are with a, not only with a range of other directors, but a range of entity covers as well. So generally management liability is not going to be suited to bigger companies and certainly not ones with independent directors. Now, let's just give you a, a brief example about that. Um, presently in a, um, uh, in a class action that I'm uh, acting as coverage counsel, there we go, the sun's back in Melbourne. Everyone all right or do you need the blinds down? Getting a few rays, that's good. Um, the, um, uh, there's now, I'm now supervising four different law firms and 11 different uh, individuals that we've put into clumps non-executive directors with one firm, the CEO with one firm, um, other, uh, other management people with one firm, and then you know one person on the board who was also a lawyer uh, with another firm. Now, all of these 11 people share in the same limit. 
Right? So as coverage counsel, I've imposed a discipline, um, which I would hope other lawyers in the market can impose as well, uh, where we actually get everyone to agree that we will all disclose exactly how much everyone spent, and we'll put it on a spreadsheet, and we'll, and we'll distribute to everybody on a monthly basis how much the limit has been eroded. Right? And so this way you've got, to, you've got to manage it, because I can assure you with the limits that are out there in the market for DNO, they're generally not enough to get you through um, uh, a class action and then also a regulatory action as well, because it's always the class action, you've got ASIC breathing down your neck as well. And so it's a real challenge to manage all that stuff with conventional DNO. With management liability, it's even much harder. And I've had this experience as well on the other side, acting for a director, when we had all of our defence costs sorted out, we thought, to get to the end of the ASIC trial. And then uh, first week into it, we find out that there's been a claim against the entity, um, that the liquidator of the entity has decided he doesn't know if he's got to pay it or not, and it's going to erode the limit by a further 700 grand. Right? And that was the money that we had set aside uh, for the trial. So shared limits are a big problem. right? Um, and But in management liability policy, shared limits are a uh, are very much a significant issue. And if you've got a company big enough to have an independent director, you should be saying, look, really, you should be looking at, um, uh, looking at your own DNO. Now, so the, here's the Venn diagram. And so if you could see the way I've tried to just set that out in a, in a clear diagram, you've got side A, minimal excess, director liability. Side B, moderate excess and company reimbursement. And then you've got side C, uh, which has usually got moderate to high excesses. Um, and the liability for the entity. But these products are really um, often cover for costs only. And I've done a paper um, which you can pick up on the way out, um, but things like employment practices liability, stat, uh, stat liability, um, pollution uh, costs, um, uh, some crisis cover, and Gary's going to talk about some claim examples shortly. Now, <clears throat> and also the, um, the pro-risk policy in particular has uh, cover for superannuation trustee liability. All right, now, just a few pointers about this. Now, this is where we get into the side C basis. And, and it's probably wrong to talk about it as side C. It's really just um, talking about entity cover. It is not actually claims against directors. So, and, but it's right to call it management liability because it's the kind of stuff that's really going to keep directors awake at night. And particularly for a small to medium enterprise, it's the kind of cover that can be the difference between them folding or not. I'll just give you a quick example. I've been acting for a pet shop um, who got prosecuted by the Glenara Council and they've folded. Uh, they didn't have a management liability policy, didn't have the 100 grand to defend the regulatory action, which is what it would take. If they didn't defend it, they were going to get their licence pulled. I think they could have defended it, but they said it's not worth it. Right? But if they had the policy, they would have survived. No question. This product is really worth it. Um, so employment liability cover, again, Gary's going to give some very good examples about that. It's the kind of thing that can lead to a business shutting down. Um, employee crime. Uh, just note in relation to employ employment liability cover, it does cover damages claims for um, uh, sexual harassment and the like, but isn't going to cover other benefits which they'd normally be entitled to under their employment contract. Um, employee crime fidelity, that's only going, to be, only going to be direct financial loss. If there are third party losses that are going to be suffered, generally excluded under fidelity policy, and you'll need to be looking at um, a professional indemnity policy or some other cover for that. And there's also statutory liability cover as well, <clears throat> which I think is the main benefit of these, of these products. It's mainly defence cost protection, and it's not a cure-all, but really it does give uh, these companies access to decent legal advice from people who know what they're doing in regulatory actions. And really, I don't want to oversell us too much, but lawyers, lawyers who know how to act in a regulatory action and ones who don't, there is a huge difference. Um, and the lawyers that do can be a great benefit and really save a company that would otherwise go under. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, just um, very quickly, I've only got about five minutes to go. <coughs> in relation to internet liability, most management liability cult policies Excuse me. just cover the defamation risk. So that is that your staff inadvertently selling a tweet about Plastic Patrond or something like that um, can defame somebody. And because nowadays the internet and can move so quickly, uh, the defamation risk can be very high. Just note that that is very different to cyber risk. Uh, management liability policies are just a defamation liability, not liability for things like data breaches, as, as we've seen with Sony, uh, loss of documents and the like. Um, that's a significant difference because, you know, it is a cheap product. Um, the cyber products are more expensive. 
Now, in relation to stat liabilities, and then I'll hand over to, hand over to Gary. This is a very active and uh, evolving um, area of the law. Regular, regulator actions are becoming frequent and they're becoming increasingly costly, but more importantly, they're becoming well near impossible to settle. Uh, decision handed down last week um, involving the CFMEU where the full court of the federal court said, we're basically going to ignore settlements. Um, sure, you can agree the facts, but then you've just got to put it up to us and we're going to make a decision. And given in some cases, particularly <clears throat> involving telcos, where the difference is in, there was one judge who awarded a $10,000 penalty for the same conduct, and then it went up to the, <laughs> went up to the full court, and then they gave a penalty of 10 million, and we're waiting to see what the High Court does about it. There's also this enormous range of judicial opinion as to what, uh, as to what the liability should be for a penalty. So if ever um, a company uh, needs a product, it really is management liability to cover stat liability. Because this is the thing, attention from a regulator, tax office, um, you know, uh, uh, ASIC or the ACCC is the kind of thing that can really sink a company. And this policy really can help them out. Um, now, the management liability policy generally covers defence costs, it's civil penalties and some unintentional what I might call criminal penalties, um, particularly for Fair Work Australia prosecutions, but usually the policies um, uh, exclude intentional misconduct, and Gary's going to talk about the public policy considerations about um, uh, some of this cover for penalties. Uh, now, just briefly, um, an evolving area is whether or not these insurance policies are relevant to penalty. Uh, presently, we're having an argument in the federal court at the moment over a director who's been found uh, guilty of some breaches of the Corporations Act, and we're having an argument about whether or not the fact that he has limited insurance or any insurance available to meet the penalty in the adverse costs order is relevant to the decision. Now, again, I've dealt with this in the paper. Um, uh, you would think if insurance does become relevant and the court has a look at whether or not you've got insurance, it's just going to drive the penalties up. And it really means to act as a general deterrent or even as a, spe a specific deterrent, uh, you know, arguing about whether or not a director is, um, should be liable for a penalty of $20,000 or $40,000 is going to become completely irrelevant if they've got insurance to cover it. Uh, once this becomes relevant, then the size of the penalties I would say, are going to escalate. Uh, but anyway, that's an area to watch. And so in summary, before I hand over to Ribo, I've just got a few uh, take-home messages. Uh, management liability is an evolution of DNO, but it's a very different product. It's cheaper, um, it provides shared limits, and it's not ideal for companies, uh, for larger companies with, it, with independent directors. Um, brokers have to take care to ensure that clients are aware of the limited nature of management liability cover. Um, it is very cheap. Uh, but it's not a cure-all. And cover for statutory liability continues to raise interesting issues in claims management. And if you are in that area, um, you can keep up to date. Our blog site, www.insuranceflashlight.com, uh, has the latest updates in relation to stat liability. Uh, we try and uh, certainly update it every week uh, with something, something brand new and interesting for you. What I want to start with are some management liability claims examples before moving on to a couple of the areas that David has provided for me an excellent segue. DNO matters with private companies are very far and few between. They don't arise often for very good reason. Very largely for privates, the DNO exposure is negligible. There's not an actively traded security and the vast majority of significant DNO matters inevitably involve significant reductions in value for external shareholders. So we're free of the worst excesses of the DNO exposure, but there is nevertheless some exposure. An insured company was a supplier of street furniture. Its principal contracts were in the government sector. An inquiry was launched by the government seeking to establish the extent to which corruption occurred in the supply segment. A common feature we know recently from the state of corruption in Victoria in relation to schools and Department of Education activity. So a not unexpected, not unusual inquiry in its nature. The insured company sought indemnity, obviously. It required legal representation 
for the officers who were required to appear and provide evidence before the inquiry. The entity itself was in need of public relations assistance. This was clearly an episode which had the potential to be significantly injurious to the public standing and reputation of the business. So both legal representation and public relations representation was secured. Ultimately, the organisation was found not to have engaged in any activity that was in its nature corrupt. It was exonerated entirely. The journey, however, was expensive. $92,000 in legal defence and representation costs was incurred. That was indemnified under the policy. $30,000 was the cost of public relations representation and activity to control the outfall. That was a section of a matter of loss that was recognised under the DNO section. In respect of employment practices liability, is clearly the greatest selling point, I believe, for private companies and management liability. The advent of workplace laws, the constant changing in the workplace environment has made this a very, very pungent area for private companies. Any entity that employs people stands in need of the cover. The contract of a long-standing contractor who provided specialist services in copyright was terminated, formally and in writing. This person had been the recipient of a series of contracts. They were quite clear about the terms of engagement and about the end point. When dismissed, formally, the contract having been terminated, the employee in question carried the matter to the Fair Work Commission, alleging that she was in fact an employee, not a contractor and that the termination was in its nature unfair. Additionally, she alleged workplace bullying. Her story was that she had been subjected to bullying in the form of loud comments, slamming of doors, prevarication of workplace performance reviews, and that her work, work load was significant and ridiculously onerous. Now here was a case that many people thought was a slam dunk. This was a person employed under a specific contract of service to provide contracting services in a highly specialised area. But the fact is that she had a company email address. She had a company card. She had a company credit card. She was required under the terms of the contract not to maintain her own individual professional indemnity insurance. Now as brokers, that would be the first point you would talk to a contractor about, isn't it? You must maintain your own professional indemnity insurance. You are not entitled to an indemnity, so you have a significant professional risks exposure. In this case, she was not obliged to carry PI insurance. She did not provide her own administration support. Those characteristics enabled the Fair Work Commission to conclude that she was indeed an employee. That ha matter having been found, the company settled the issue $100,000 later. In relation to crime, a real estate agency financial manager emailed the company to tell them that he was in China having treatment for problematic fingernails. I imagine the klaxon horn started sounding when that email was received. When three days later a second email was received informing the company that he would not be returning to his workplace, at that stage alarm would have rung loud. The employee had been there for some six years. He'd had responsibility for bond payments and the payments of contractors who were engaged to provide property maintenance and other services. The employee himself didn't have the authority to make payments. But what he did, of course, was to prepare for authorisation all payments. So he stood in a powerful, controlling position. Insured engaged an external consultant, an accounting consultant,
consultant to undertake a forensic examination of all payments that had been made under his watch. At that point it was discovered, not unsurprisingly, given the circumstances of his resignation and treatment in China, that in fact $100,000 had been diverted from the proper accounts to his accounts and he'd done a bunk with it. The claim was settled at $100,000 less the excess. It was clearly a direct financial loss and in this matter there was of course no opportunity for any form of recovery action. He was in China and it was going to be impossible to extract him. Finally, the other major selling point of management liability, as David has emphasised and quite properly so. Statutory liability has become an enormous area of exposure for private enterprises. Not unjustifiable, we have a raft of laws. We have workplace laws, we have workplace health and safety laws, environmental and pollution. A great many regulatory actions now as well as competition law that provide manifest exposures. In the matter here, an apprentice was inspecting drilling equipment when debris collapsed on top of him. He suffered catastrophic injuries which ultimately resulted in his death. A very tragic and unfortunate circumstance. Of course, it being a workplace death, a full occupational health and safety investigation was launched. That having been conducted and concluded, a prosecution was launched against the entity and against directors for failing to provide a safe place of work. Section 21.1 of the Workplace Health and Safety Act. Solicitors were appointed, they represented the client and they represented directors who had been charged with offences under the Act. The company was indeed found liable that was inevitable. So the defence here was all about mitigation. The defence, it was argued in this case by the insurer, was very successful to the extent that the fine levied on the corporation, on the company, was $50,000 as opposed to a potential maximum of $250,000. Now in this matter, the fine was not indemnified. The policy in question excluded fines, but it did meet the costs of legal representation. $120,000 was indemnified by the insurer. Those are the sorts of things that are common to us in looking at management liability. It's a portmanteau which provides an enormous breadth of cover, if not an enormous depth of cover. But the two major features are very clearly employment practices and statutory liability. I'd warrant that that's how you as brokers have sold management liability and how you will continue to sell management liability and that's to your well and good. It's an essential component of risk management for small corporates. The emerging risks, it won't surprise you, that I see in the area are related very directly to those areas. Occupational health and safety. One of the problems we have with OC health and safety is data lags. It's very, very difficult to get very accurate contemporary data in a timely manner. So we're always looking at lags. Just to look at New South Wales, because so many of the problems of the world originate in New South Wales, particularly through the district court, as lawyers will tell you. In 2013-14, 6,900 notices were issued. 14,500 workplace visits were undertaken. 52 successful prosecutions. 59 were launched. As David will tell you, and Chloe and other lawyers in the room, that is an incredibly high success rate. That's the sort of success rate that ASIC would kill for. 271 prosecutions are in train at 30th of June 2014. That means on current success rates, something around the order of 240 employers are looking at significant problems. Highest exposure area statistically, leaving aside mining, which is of course a cot case, transport and storage, that won't surprise Marty Owen, 
agriculture, forestry and fishing, manufacturing, the usual suspects. All businesses that we can get our gums into, Wilco. Data lags mean the effects of legislated changes are very, very difficult to foretell and predict. If we look at some national occupational health and safety data for 2012-13, again, excluding the mining sector, because if we start talking about it, we'll be here for a month. 82,000 proactive workplace visits. 55,000 reactive visits, that is responses to workplace incidents and accidents. There are over 1,000 active field inspectors now involved in workplace health and safety. 47,000 notices were issued to employers. Those are breach and correction notices. 338 legal proceedings finalised of which 293 <laughs> resulted in a conviction or an order or an agreement. Mayor culpa, $14.5 million in fines. In terms of fair work, we have the same problem. For 2011-12, we had 37,000 complaints lodged, 15,000 related to unfair dismissal. In the October-December quarter of 2014, just in that three-month period, 3,610 unfair dismissal actions. An emerging area continues to be workplace bullying. I've spoken about it before at pro-risk seminars. New bullying laws came into force in January 2014. I'm not sure about your workplaces, but Insurance House and Pro-Risk, we all had to sit through three hours of seminars by an external consultant workplace lawyer telling us what we could and couldn't do. So management liability, it's a wonderful cover. Why then the subject? Why cure or curse? Well, you've seen the cure. The cure has in many cases been wonderful. The employment practices liability, the DNO case, the crime case, the EPL case. In all of those matters, DNO provided a wonderful, very effective cure to the ill. So is it a curse or is it a cure? Well, of course, it's a little bit of each. The first problem that may be a curse is indeed that that David highlighted, shared limits. I'm a director of 18 companies. Now, nothing keeps me awake at night. I drink a lot of red wine. <laughs> if something was to keep me awake at night, it would be that, the fact that there are shared limits. I know full well what I've done, how I've exercised my prerogatives, how I've expressed my responsibilities as a director. One can't always be as confident about the actions and motives of others. In management liability, that conflict that's inherent in shared limits is manifest and it's highlighted by the fact that not only are you sharing with other directors, but you're sharing with other covers. So if the policy is indeed a portmanteau with a single limit of liability, then there's a problem, a genuine, real problem of the sort that David averted to in his presentation, where you think money is going to be there for defence, but it may not in fact be there. I rarely do ads at these presentations, but I'm happy to say that the pro-risk policy doesn't suffer that ill. If you affect a $1 million management liability policy, you'll find that the schedule specifies $2.5 million of limit because the other limits are in addition. The adequacy of sublimits and coverage confusion was also highlighted by David. There are limitations in respect of crime coverage. It is not a full comprehensive crime coverage. It's direct financial loss only. There is the issue of internet liability versus IT liability versus cyber liability. Three very, very different forms of liability revolving around the same word games. And you need to be very careful in ensuring that you understand the differences I'm sure you do. In relation to statutory liability coverage, 
the issues become abundant. The possible curse for you is in divining precisely what is covered. Is it fines of all sorts? Is it only legal expenses for defences? Is it non-criminal fines and related legal defence? There are significant differences in the coverage provided in respective fines by differing insurers. You need to be very, very careful that non-criminal fines are covered and that quasi-criminal fines are covered if indeed that's the impression you're conveying to clients. There are significant public policy issues that are still to be explored, I believe, in respect of management liability and stat liability in particular. We have fines as deterrents. Is the deterrent effect removed or ameliorated by the existence of insurance? Certainly one judge in South Australia believes it to be, to be the case because in a significant workplace matter where a company had adduced evidence to the satisfaction of any reasonable application of justice and was found not to have been negligent in the, the matter of a fall by a young employee who for reasons best known to himself failed to properly anchor himself when working at height, fell, catastrophically injured, Despite the fact that the company was able to point to his training program, to their own training program, to adduce evidence, as I've said, that ought to have satisfied a court that they had acted quite well, in fact impeccably well in the matter of training and policy, they were fined $270,000 because of the existence of the insurance. So if the deterrent effect is being weighed in these matters, and there must surely be a a temptation for that to be the case, then we have a real social problem because the workplace laws are there to provide protection for everyone. The issue for you is being sure that you properly understand and communicate the extent of coverage to clients. Because if you fail to do that, ultimately your professional indemnity insurers will be paying and paying and paying. Finally, there are coverage issues more generally. What, for example, is the position of a management liability policy where shareholder agreements in private companies are breached or alleged to have been breached? Most of the brokers here who are running businesses will have shareholder agreements. So you'll be familiar with the area. So what happens to the management liability policy where there is a shareholder disagreement alleging breach of that agreement? I asked the architect of what I think is the market leading management liability policy what his view on it was and he simply didn't know because it's not happened yet. But it may happen. Plenty of broking businesses are restructuring for sale as their principals age. It's a quite old business. The average age of broking principals in Australia is around 58 years. So it's going to become just in that segment an interesting issue. I don't have an answer for it. I don't know whether it'll be covered or not, to be honest. Time will tell. An even bigger issue for you as we sit here because it is absolutely alive, is the claims trigger for management liability. If you take nothing away from today except this, I'll be happy because you've protected yourself and your client. A company was retained to manufacture and install sliding glass doors in a Victorian school. Some months after installation, a teacher was seriously injured when a door dislodged from its tracks and fell on him. So it's a significant injury. A bolt which secured the sliding doors had not been properly fastened during the installation. Now ordinarily you'd think, well, it's an installation error, it's a straightforward product liability loss, yes? There's damage to a third party here from the product, it flows directly, there's clearly been negligence, 
in the absence of demonstrated negligence, I think we could point to res ipsa loquitur. The deed speaks for itself. It's an episode not unsimilar in a great many of its characteristics to that that befell those tragically young people who were killed when the Grollo wall fell in the old brewery, the top end of Swanston Street. Eerily similar. Fortunately, not the same tragic consequences. But the same actual outcome in many respects. Well, this wasn't a straightforward liability loss. It was clearly a liability, but the Occupational Health and Safety Act at section 23 demands that a company ensure, so far as it is reasonably practicable, that persons other than its employees are not exposed to risks to their health and safety arising from their actions. That is a broad and sweeping provision. So this is no longer simply a liability matter. In this particular instance, there was indeed a workplace health and safety action mounted. The company expended $60,000 in investigation of the costs and in defence before the authority acted. It then expended another $120,000 in legals defending a very, very serious action. Both those elements of the claim were ultimately paid by the insurer, most fortunately. But at the time, the broker hadn't notified this. When it happened, it was notified as a professional, excuse me, as a public liability loss, not as a management liability loss. The message nowadays is very simple. Any injury to a third party that occurs in a workplace environment, and remember that workplace is very, very broadly defined in legislation, may result in a workplace health and safety action so you need to be considering if a client contacts you in those circumstances and has a management liability policy, you probably need to notify. In fact, I would say you certainly need to notify. 